Good afternoon and welcome to the Senate Committee on Growth and Infrastructure. Will the Secretary please call the roll? Senator Hammond? Senator Hansen? Here. Senator Pizzina? Present. Senator Spearman? Here. Chair Harris? Here. Thank you. We have four members present. Uh, please go ahead and mark Senator Hammond present when he arrives. We have four bills on the agenda today. We're going to take them slightly out of order and start with Assembly Bill 56. And I'll invite Mr. Schilling and Mr. McGarney. All right, lovely. Welcome. Uh, go ahead and begin whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, Chair Harris, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Ryan McInerney, Director of Communications and Government Affairs for the Nevada Department of Transportation. Uh, with me to my right is Mr. Rod Schilling, our uh, NDOT's Chief Traffic Operations Engineer. Today we are presenting on AB 56, uh, NDOT's bill on hard shoulder running. Uh, this bill essentially would allow authorized emergency vehicles to uh, to drive in the paved shoulder of a highway under certain circumstances, as well as public transit. We have, uh, for awareness, we also have uh, some members from RTC in the audience. Uh, if there are any further questions with respect to the public transit piece, uh, including Deputy CEO Dave Swallow. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Mr. Schilling uh, for the remainder of the presentation. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record again, Rod Schelling, Chief Traffic Operations Engineer for the Nevada Department of Transportation. And as uh, Ryan was talking about, so again, this is uh, hard shoulder running um, to allow authorized emergency vehicles to be able to um, utilize the uh, shoulder for uh, certain vehicles such as freeway service patrol, tow trucks, hazardous material vehicles, uh, in addition uh, from the previous um, Hearing with assembly, we included corner vehicles in addition to that, uh, also as well as the public transit buses to be able to drive on that paved shoulder for a di uh, di uh, lengths longer than 200 feet where lawfully placed signage does allow. Some of the current issues, um, I'll go in there and kind of show that to you. Um, there's limited legal authority associated uh, with the current statutes out there, and there's uncertainty with that. So the 200 feet limit is one of those issues, uh, not being able to utilize that shoulder uh, for those authorized emergency vehicles. In addition, public buses, you know, um, unpredictability for them. This would optimize their transit systems to be able to do that. There is a timeline associated with this um, bill upon passage. What we're going to be doing is crafting the procedural elements, the regulations associated with this uh, bill moving forward. In addition to that, there is a prep for public education in the campaign. So the Nevada Department of Transportation in partnership with the RTC Southern Nevada has developed that um, outreach and what that would look like to make this come effective on January 1st of 2024. When we started this, we conducted some research with other states and uh, looked at what similar laws that they had in place for shoulder running. So that included states such as California, Colorado, Illinois, Kansas, Maryland, Minnesota, New Jersey, other states and also Oregon uh, and Virginia. So what we found is most of these states 
had similar issues to what we're uh, going forward with, so they had to do some statute changes too. Uh, Colorado's one, for example, to allow bus on shoulders, and one that's a prime example for the guidelines to follow is Minnesota. They've been doing that for well over 20 years. Some of the existing laws that we reviewed uh, as part of the proposal for AB 56 includes 482B.210, that's when overtaken on the right side allowed. Uh, 484B.267 is the operation of vehicles on approach of an authorized emergency vehicle or the official vehicle of that regulatory agency. In addition to that is 44B.587, which is the obedience to the signs and the restrictions on driving on a controlled access highway. So the issues that we've seen with the existing law are with 44B.210 when overtaken on the right is it limits that travel to no more than 200 feet in that section of pavement on a controlled access facility with a mar uh, marked as a traffic lane. In addition to that, there is no definition for a traffic incident management vehicle, the tow cars, public transit motor bus in regard to these rules of the road. In addition, we also added for the coroner and the hazmat vehicles as well. And for 484B.267, for the operation of the vehicle on approach of an authorized emergency vehicle or the official vehicle of that regulatory agency, the issue we found there is yielding on the shoulder by the drivers will impede the movement for the desired use of that shoulder. For 484B.587, the obedience to the signs and the restrictions on driving on that controlled access facility, the issue there is that it prohibits anyone from driving a vehicle on that controlled access facility outside of that marked traffic lane or marked entrance to that exit lane. So what we proposed in association with 44B.210, um, that's when they're overtaken on the right side, is to amend that to include the exception of overtaking a vehicle, except as provided in the new sub subsection four of that. Add into that subsection to provide for the vehicle movement exceptions to those authorized emergency vehicles, which includes the traffic incident management vehicle, the tow car vehicle, the public transit motor bus, that's going to be driven on that paved shoulder when lawfully placed signage does allow that. And also add the definitions for those vehicles. For 44B.267, that's the obedience to the signs, is to amend that to reflect that the law enforcement officer can direct where other vehicles are moved to yield. And now also amend that so that the driver shall not drive or stop on the shoulder where that subsection of the NRS 44B.210 cites for those vehicles that can travel there. And for 484B.587, again, we wanted to amend where we can require to that, uh, refer to the new subsection 3 to refer to that subsection 4 of that NRS 44B.210 to allow those vehicles to drive on a paved shoulder where that lawfully placed signage does allow such. In addition to that, uh, when we met with the assembly on this, we were uh, including a public education plan. We've already moved forward with that. We have that in place. The intent is to support the implementation of this assembly bill for educating the public, updating the signage and all the reference materials, and anything informing those operators. This includes coordination with our partners with RT, so RTC Southern Nevada, the Department of Motor Vehicles, our first responder communities, uh, media briefings, press releases, um, social outlets, blog posts, newsletters, et cetera, including a web page, uh, some of our dynamic message signs that are out there for that campaign as well. Uh, bus signage, well, they'll have that out there as part of it. And then also we're using consultant support to help us in this. And just as a friendly reminder, there is an amendment that put forth by Washoe County on behalf of Clark County as a proposed amendment to remove the language within the definition of the corner vehicle relating to those vehicles operated by the mortuary personnel. So this is the uh, proposed language that's within there for that corner vehicle to remove that mortuary personnel. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the committee? Okay, not seeing any, y'all can step back and we'll go ahead and open it up for testimony in support of AB 56. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. Hello. 
Good afternoon, Chair Harris, members of the committee. For the record, I'm Paul Enos. I am the CEO of the Nevada Trucking Association. We're here today to testify in favor of Assembly Bill 56. Our tow truck operators, some of our members in the Nevada Trucking Association, there's, they are those first responders. We think this is a common sense bill that will help expedite clearing traffic and responding to these emergencies. So we appreciate your consideration and the department bringing this forward. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Ashley Garza Kennedy representing Clark County here to testify in support with the uh, friendly amendment that was presented and just for for clarification on the assembly side this uh, was an amendment that Washoe County worked on um, and as it came over um, our Clark County coroner and our Washoe County coroner kind of coordinate together on this amendment the amendment is presented on behalf of Clark County so I just wanted to make that clear for Washoe thank you Good afternoon, Chair Harris, members of the committee. David Swallow uh, with the Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada, here to testify in support of this uh, proposed bill, uh, just in terms of incident response and as well as the opportunity to possibly have transit service uh, get past congested areas on the freeway should the, should the occasion arise. Okay, is there anyone in Las Vegas who'd like to testify support of AB 56? All right, BPS, can we check the phone lines, please? If you would like to testify in support of AB 56, please press star nine or raise hand within Zoom to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify at this time. All right, thank you. Anyone here in Carson City would like to testify in opposition to AB 56? Okay, not seeing anyone. Anyone in Las Vegas for opposition to AB 56? All right, BPS, uh, can we check the phones for opposition to AB 56? If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 56, please press star nine or raise hand within Zoom to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Okay, thanks. Uh, Madam Secretary, please note Senator Hammond has graced us with his presence. Anyone in the neutral position here for AB 56? All right, anyone in Las Vegas in neutral? Okay, BPS, can we check the phones, please? If you would like to testify in neutral for AB 56, please press star nine or raise hand in Zoom to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Okay, uh, unless Mr. Schilling and Mr. McInerney, I did it right this time, hopefully, uh, want to make any closing comments. All right, we'll close out the hearing then on AB 56 and open up the hearing on Senate Bill 451 and welcome uh, our colleague, Vice Chair Spearman, to the table. Go ahead and uh, begin whenever you're ready, Senator. Good afternoon, Chair Harris and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, I am State Senator Pat Spearman, and I represent Senate District 1 in Clark County. And I'm here today to present to you uh, Senate Bill 451, uh, which radically, 
radically, operative word radically, uh, changes some of the ways that we do uh, renewable energy here in the state. And I will start off by saying that I know that hydrogen is a controversial subject, uh, but I think that uh, when you hear from some of the folks who've already been in the industry, uh, you'll see why we need to look at this as a, another alternative. Uh, so I'll have with me today uh, testifying, I've got uh, Roxana Beckel, Beck Mohammadi, Beck Mohammadi, <laughs> Beck Mohammadi. <laughs> uh, uh, and she'll start leading us off. Steve Polakalis will sort of lead us off, but uh, I'd like for you to, to listen and um, listen with an open mind and an open ear. Uh, the other thing that I will say is that the $8 billion that the Biden administration has already allocated for uh, funding hydrogen hubs, uh, I don't think would have been done if it was something that was going to hurt us. And so with that, Steve. Uh, thank you, Senator Spearman, and thank you for the support uh, throughout uh, this session and the last regarding this subject. Uh, thank you, Chair Harris, Harris and members of the committee. My name is Steve Policalis, uh, attorney at law. I represent the United States Hydrogen Alliance. And with that, I will introduce Rock, Rick, Roxana beck Mohammadi, who will uh, present you with the, her testimony regarding the, the, the bill. I w would like to say at the outset there is a, a proposed amendment that is on Nellis, so that's probably the substantive text we should be uh, considering. Thank you. And uh, so um, you'll see what's been deleted from that, so those, uh, any comments regarding those things are now moot as it relates to those stakeholders. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Harris and committee members. My name is Roxana beck Um Apparently, my last name is a little bit more complicated than the topic of hydrogen, or at least I'm hoping that will be the case. I am the founder. Oh, I need to spell my name. There's a lot of letters. Uh, first name is R-O-X-A-N-A. -A. Last name is B as in boy, E as in elephant, K as in kite, E as in elephant, M as a monkey, O as an opera, H as in hat, A as an apple, M as a monkey, M as a monkey, A as an apple, D as in dog, I as an igloo. Just wanted to make first sure. First time we've ever had to do that. Huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure it was accurate for the record. And, and after your testimony, you can also provide a card to the secretary as well. Thank you, Senator. Yeah. Um, as, I was, as I was saying, I'm the founder and executive director of the U.S. Hydrogen Alliance. Our organization is comprised of companies across the fuel cell and hydrogen supply chain, including Southwest Gas, um, who is here in attendance. The U.S. Hydrogen Alliance is a business trade association that assists states in developing pragmatic and well-rounded policies it's very critical for us. My organization is not just here to advocate for hydrogen, but for a diverse, robust, and reliable energy system and clean transportation, because we were founded with the highest integrity and mission to serve our country. The following statements are based on feedback from industry, academics, the US Department of Energy, as well as my, perspec my perspective as an energy engineer with an emphasis in energy systems integration. SB 451 was crafted from the understanding of the role and status of hydrogen in the state, country, and globally. Hydrogen is and has always played a critical role in our lives and precedes our existence. From the moment after the Big Bang, 90% of the universe became occupied by hydrogen. From there, a star, our sun, lights our planet from hydrogen fusion. Our plants that depend on that light from the sun have also relied over the last century on nitrogen fertilizer, hydrogen being the main component of it. And it now feeds 80% of the earth. It was also humankind's ingenuity that leveraged hydrogen fuel to get us to the moon. It was also hydrogen that allows us to desulfurize our crude oil, the primary reason why acid rain no longer destroys our environment. So what is my point? Hydrogen is not novel. It predates all of us, and it certainly will be here after us. Humans have been leveraging hydrogen to decarbonize the transportation sector, industrial processes, as well as providing zero emission power, enabling other clean technologies like solar and wind, storing curtailed electricity for seasons, not hours like battery, uh, battery storage solutions, and it also fills gaps in our evolving energy systems. These are the reasons why the federal government 
just allocated $22.5 billion in the last nine months to incentivize hydrogen, why over 128 countries have developed national hydrogen strategies, why a team of 40 companies have joined together across Nevada and Arizona to pursue an $8 billion grant opportunity to build a hydrogen hub right here in the state. SB 451 asks the state agencies to assess and incentivize hydrogen to support the current and future hydrogen activities in the state, ensuring a nuanced, tailored, and appropriate plan is developed, one that optimizes job creation, environmental benefits, clean transportation, and economic development. We also need the state agencies to prepare for the potential of a few billion dollars coming into the state from the federal hydrogen hub incentives as well as private investment. I will let my colleagues at Air Liquide explain why this multinational company built their largest hydrogen facility in the world right here in North Las Vegas. I will also allow the Regional Transportation Commissions of Washoe County and Southern Nevada explain why they are adopting fuel cell electric transit buses that produce zero emissions and abates carcinogenic emissions for all Nevadans, especially in areas that are hard hit with diesel uh, emissions. I want to say that hydrogen is already here in the Silver State, and I urge you to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, if we can go down south. Um, there's representatives from Eric there. We can invite them to the table. Let's see if we have representatives from Air Lakeed. Come on up. Hello, go ahead and hit that uh, blue, the button in front of you, and then go ahead and state your name and spell it before you begin. Hello, Ed Garcia, uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, E-D-G-A-R-C-I-A. Uh, I'm actually here today on behalf of Nevada Hydrogen, which was the one of the coordinating entities of the Nevada Hydrogen Hub application uh, in Nevada, uh, a partnership between Nevada and Arizona, which recently submitted to under the Federal Investment and Jobs Act uh, for the hydrogen hub application. Okay, we'll let you speak in support if that's okay. Okay. All right. Sure. Go ahead. Happy to answer any questions. All right, we'll do. Go ahead and shut off the mic for me. All right, Senator Spearman, uh, additional pieces to your presentation before we take questions? Uh, yes, I think um, look, I think Andrew Woods is there from UNLV. If he's not, he should be there shortly. You know. um, a little known fact that UNLV has been involved in uh, hydrogen uh, for a minute or two now. So, Mr. Woods. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you for your time. Uh, Andrew Woods, W-O-O-D-S. I'm the director of the Center for Business and Economic Research at UNLV. Um, we were involved with the Hydrogen Hubs Project, which is about a $1.1 billion grant. We just submitted this month um, between the state of Arizona and Nevada on hydro clean hydrogen. Um, 400 million of that is potentially impact would impact Nevada and particularly 16 million for UNLV and this is a partnership between UNLV, CSN, Workforce Connections and several other higher education and uh, organizations here in Southern Nevada and we're in support. Okay, committee members, do we have questions? All right. We're going to go ahead and open it up for testimony at this time, Senator, if that's okay with you. Mm -hmm, sure. And I've got one more. Let me see Joy back there with Southwest Gas. Yeah, we're doing testimony support anyway. So you can come on up. Ms. Holliday. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Joy Holiday Sparrow, Holiday like the season, Sparrow like Captain Jack if you're into Pirates of the Caribbean. I am a public affairs administrator with Southwest Gas, and we, <laughs> we, are, <laughs> we are here in support of SB 451. Southwest Gas is heavily invested in the future of hydrogen economy in Nevada. As you've already heard, hydrogen technologies are already being developed and deployed throughout the country and the entire world. So the issue isn't whether hydrogen will be part of the future, it's just a matter of whether Nevada will take advantage of the vast amounts of resources that are available to us. 
Um, as you heard from Mr. Woods, Southwest Gas was part of the application for a hydrogen hub project together with the state of I'm sorry, with the state of Arizona to access the billions of available federal dollars for hydrogen projects across the country. Our partners in this application included the RTC of Southern Nevada, UNLV, and the Governor's Office of Energy. I also think it's worth noting that the previous administration initiated the process for partnering with us on the hydrogen hub application, and the current administration has decided to continue pursuing the application, so it's not a partisan issue. We have also partnered with UNLV on a hydrogen study that will determine how much hydrogen can be blended into our existing infrastructure without having adverse impacts on end uses. Hydrogen resources are essentially limitless and offers a great deal of energy storage solutions, making this very versatile and it can be used to decarbonize areas of our economy that can be considered difficult. So together we believe that hydrogen and renewable natural gas are a powerful solution for Nevada's sustainable energy future, leading us to support this piece of legislation. So we thank the Senator for presenting this bill um, and and that adopts the provisions for further development and use of hydrogen technology um, in this state, and we urge its passing. I also want to put on record that I have my colleague James Stein here if there are any questions whatsoever on behalf of Southwest Gas. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Harris, members of the committee. Mark Hackman, H-A-C-K-M-A-N-N, -N, with I3 Public Affairs, and I'm here today representing Nevada Petroleum Marketers. Uh, in support of 451. The Nevada's petroleum jobbers operate terminals and bulk plants that distribute all permitted transportation fuels throughout the state of Nevada, and this should, this should include clean hydrogen. Uh, there are approximately 1,000 public fueling sites in the state selling all forms of tra transportation fuels and lubricants. Traditional retail refueling sites have been overlooked by state and utility officials as potential EV fast charging sites, and we don't want that to happen with hydrogen. Specifically, petroleum jobbers support SB 51 because they have the knowledge, experience, and infrastructure in place to make a smooth and efficient transition to hydrogen as the primary transportation fuel in Nevada. Again, Mark Hackman with I3 Public Affairs in support of this bill. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Harris, members of the committee. I'm David Swallow, Deputy CEO with the Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada here, uh, testifying in support of SB 451. Uh, the RTC is certainly interested in continuing to foster uh, clean transportation solutions, ones that lead to good air quality and a better quality of life for everyone. Uh, we have been, over the years, transitioning our fleet away from diesel buses. Now we're moving towards, uh, as we've transitioned from diesel to compressed natural gas, now we're beginning to transition to zero emission vehicles. We have uh, nearly a dozen hydrogen fuel cell electric buses on order. In fact, we received our first two buses uh, just last month. Happy to report. It's critically important as we look at different options, whether they're battery electric buses or hydrogen fuel cell electric buses, which is the right application, we find that we get a better range or a comparable range uh, for our hydrogen fuel cell electric buses uh, over the batteries. And so we are looking to continue to uh, transition our fleet over, looking to get to 50% by the year 2035 and 100% ZEVs by 2050. So. Again, we support this bill. Hello, Will Adler here with Silver State Government Relations representing ACES Delta. Uh, ACES Delta would like to add their full support uh, to Senate Bill uh, 451 and the amendment proposed to it. Uh, ACES is a company operating uh, in Utah today that is uh, providing a hydrogen replacement to a current coal-fired power plant that is operational right now, and it is actually going to provide a blended hydrogen natural gas facility that will ultimately green up the power supply of Utah, but would like to do the same in Nevada. They, they've applied for a hub application that would partner Utah and Nevada through a pipeline doing similar processes, but overall the, the, the tone is the same where hydrogen is the future, sort of is that next thing around the corner, and a lot of folks are looking at it as should Nevada take part or, or are we on, on that leading edge but I, I would prefer Nevada tries to take that first step and is the leading edge as being one of the states is left behind honestly because uh, we're seeing lots of federal investment in this billions of dollars and it, 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 it is on Nevada to be there to receive those if possible so thank you very much and full support of this bill 
afternoon, Madam Chair. For the record, Danny Thompson representing the Southern Nevada Building Trades and the Operating Engineers Local 3 and Local 12. You know, the legislature passed Senate Bill 358 in 2019 that declared that it was the policy of the state to uh, in, have a 50% uh, uh, renewable energy by 2030. And if you read the declarations in that bill, I think it's a fits perfectly for what you're talking about here today. The first is encourage and accelerate the development of new renewable energy projects for the economic health and environmental benefits provided to Nevada. Two, become a leader, producer, and consumer of clean and renewable energy with a goal of achieving by 2050 an amount of energy production from zero carbon dioxide emissions resources equal to the total amount of electricity sold by providers of electric service in Nevada. And three, ensure that the benefits of the increased use of the portfolio energy systems and energy efficiency me measures are received by Nevada residents such as benef such benefits include without limitation air quality, reduced water use, and a more diverse portfolio of resources for generating electricity, reducing fossil fossil fuel consumption and more stable rates for retail customers. You know, uh, we right now today, according to the PUC, uh, we are 29% of that goal um, and in 2023. We've got seven more years and I don't think we can leave anything off of our, our table that, uh, that can help us reach that portfolio standard. So we're in support of the bill. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Harris and members of the committee. My name is Amy Shogren, that's S-H-O-G-R-E-N, with Black and Wadhams on behalf of General Motors. And um, we are here in support of SB 451 to promote the development and use of clean hydrogen technology in Nevada. Um, when fed into a fuel cell, clean hydrogen can power vehicles without releasing harmful emissions, and it has the potential to significantly reduce air pollution in the form of greenhouse gas. Adoption of refueling infrastructure will also be key in the Silver State, and the use of clean hydrogen can also uh, facilitate economic development and diversification in Nevada. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Harris. Committee for the record, my name is Terry Graves, representing the Nevada Manufacturers Association and Nevada Trucking Association. And to the extent that it's already been addressed, trucking is looking at utilizing hydrogen for transportation purposes. And the Nevada Manufacturing Association manufacturing utilizes natural gas and can also utilize hydrogen in their process, as well as heating, as well as process heating, as well as in some cases as feedstock. So we're here to support the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Harris and members of the committee. Reagan Comis with r, r Partners here today representing the Nevada Mining Association. And we'd like to voice our support for SB 451 with the amendment. Uh, we recognize the need for Nevada to look at the resources that are available and the potential that hydrogen has to produce clean energy. We also appreciate the sponsor working with us in amending the bill. We believe that additional study needs to be done before the promotion of converting abandoned and inactive mines into resources for clean energy production. Senator Spearman has been a champion for responsible use of technology and the use of resources, and we commend her efforts in SB 451. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Andy McKay, uh, Executive Director of the Franchise Auto Dealers Association, fully support the bill. want to thank uh, Senator Spearman for being in front of this issue. And we've had a discussions going back, I think, almost two years on this. Uh, this is an exciting technology. And as the state and, frankly, the country goes to decarbonization of our industry, um, it's our opinion that this is, this is ultimately where we're, go where we're going to want to be. As alluded to earlier, it's, it's, it's infinite, uh, the energy source for all intents and purposes. So we, we fully support this, and we're excited with our manufacturer partners, what they're bringing to the market. And um, respectfully request the committee's support of this bill. Thank you. Afternoon, Bobby or not with r, r Partners on behalf of TC Energy. Uh, we'll just say ditto and thank you, Senator Spearman, for bringing the bill. Thank you. Chair Harris, members of the committee. Good afternoon, I'm Mark Fiorentino with the law firm of Kemfer Crow. We represent the Washoe County RTC. So we will say ditto with respect to the testimony that you got from the Southern Nevada RTC. 
we've been committed in Washoe County for quite some time on sustainable um, transportation and bus technologies. We have a couple of hydrogen buses that are, we're hoping will join the fleet soon, and we're regularly looking for federal grant funding to um, expand that portion of the fleet. So to the extent this bill helps us develop that infrastructure in Nevada, we're supportive and grateful for your time. Thank you. Greg Esposito representing the Nevada State Pipe Trades. Uh, we're looking forward to the jobs that this technology will bring to the state. Uh, thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and go down to uh, Las Vegas for testimony in support of Senate Bill 451. Go ahead and start when you're ready. Thank you, Chair Harris and committee. Uh, once again, Ed Garcia, I, I just wanted to echo everyone's comments. And as I indicated before, I'm here on behalf of Nevada Hydrogen and being involved with the Hydrogen Hub opportunity, we believe is the first of all will be many more uh, efforts to come to promote hydrogen development in the region. Uh, and just wanted to thank the Senator for bringing this bill. It's, it's legislation like SB 451 that'll demonstrate to the federal government that Nevada is willing to lean in on this emerging, emerging industry and will serve to make Nevada more competitive versus other states and the region more competitive when the, in this rapidly emerging area. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and committee. Uh, I'm Tim Farkas, uh, F-A-R-K-A-S. I'm with a green energy company called Amoresco. We uh, also were part of the hydrogen hub application process. Um, having been in the green energy field for, for decades, uh, hydrogen is a particularly exciting uh, fuel source because it does provide baseload power for buildings, uh, process hydrogen for manufacturing processes, fleet fuel, which is to cross over uh, all these different areas is, is really remarkable, and also utility. Uh, there, there are already utilities adding uh, hydrogen to uh, to cleaner, greener gas that goes into your, our typical natural gas pipeline. So um, it is a, an important type of fuel for the future uh, of a diverse green energy solution. I, I appreciate this bill, and we're, we, we look forward to working with it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Andrew Woods, Director of the Center for Business and Economic Research, and echoing everyone's comments, and also as well, thank Senator Spearman for bringing forward this and her leadership on the hydrogen hubs and hydrogen, clean hydrogen for the region. Um, we do forecast at the center that there's about $4.6 trillion uh, coming in the clean energy revolution. And as we see in other states in Arizona and Utah, there is leadership on this issue. And uh, going through this process on hydrogen hubs, we would like to see the state of Nevada as well provide more leadership for um, we're the direction and making sure that we can be competitive on these federal grants that are going to be coming down the line and opportunities to work with industry. Thank you. Mr. Chance. I'm, I'm kidding. Testifying in support. All right, go ahead. Madam Chair, uh, Alfredo Alonzo with Law firm of Lewis and Roca. Um, today, on behalf of uh, uh, the Alliance of Automobile Innovation, which is all of the major manufacturers uh, worldwide. Um, currently, we have six member companies that are doing extensive research and R and D on uh, on uh, on this subject and looking at um, obviously beyond uh, uh, EVs as as perhaps more of an addition to. Um, and the reason that it's important, and I'll talk about something that hasn't been probably discussed, is is when you're trying to convert, or we're going to go from uh, internal combustion engine, one of the most important issues is how easy is it for the average person to get these vehicles? And then when they, when they do, how do you fuel them? Um, the, the difficult part of, of having electric vehicles is obviously... Uh, plugging them in, and do you do that in a multifamily setting, apartment buildings, uh, uh, in a, in a work setting? Obviously, if you've if you've got an electric vehicle, it's 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 tough to find uh, a charger that isn't occupied in in some areas. So, uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles again run the same way; they run with uh, with electric motors. 
Um, they have the same type of efficiency uh, as an electric vehicle. Uh, in many cases, they have much higher range, more, more like an combust, uh, internal combustion engine. Uh, and they can be sold at gas stations. So you can fill quickly. Uh, and you can use existing infrastructure. And again, uh, that's why six of the major, and, and, and I'll, I can tell you that Toyota, Hyundai, Honda, Ford, BMW, and GM are all looking at this and have been doing extensive work. Toyota actually has vehicles on the ground throughout California right now. Uh, so I, I think from a standpoint of, of Nevada's uniqueness and, and whether you're talking rural areas or our urban areas where you have a lot of people in one, uh, um, in one apartment complex, this, this could really fit that bill and, and affect, uh, again, as, as people have indicated, the revolution towards uh, carbon-free uh, get us there uh, faster and cleaner. And uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions. You can try, Senator Hammond. All right, so any question you said. Um, so you, you had these, these vehicles, and the hydrocell, I think, is underneath the vehicle. It, it seems like it was in a cartridge. I think I saw one once. I was driving next to one in California over the weekend. So uh, what do you know about changing out those cells? I mean, how easy is it? Is it, is it more um, in line with the gas? Like you go to a gas station, you put a, the, the, you know, the pump in, you, you put gas in, because I, I, if it's underneath the, the carriage, is there somebody underneath there who's going in there and replacing it uh, within five minutes? Uh, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Alfredo Alonso again. Uh, it's my understanding it's a five-minute fill. Uh, it's, it's a quick... Uh, um, uh, it, oh, okay. I, I will let someone who knows a lot of, more about this, and I've also got, uh, I think... Uh, three of the companies uh, will be calling in that can probably answer those questions as well. Man, I had you there. I had you, and you're, now you're, you're, you're wiggling off the line here. You had everybody behind you shaking their heads, yes. You didn't look back there, did you? Uh, I did not, Senator, but uh, I, I wasn't gonna go very much further anyway. <laughs> that, that's what your Little League coach said too. <laughs> go ahead. Um, for the record, Roxana beck Mohammedy, Senator, great question. Um, actually, yes, we can refuel it like an incumbent, any of the incumbent technologies right now. What's nice is that there isn't a paradigm shift. Um, essentially, you just go to a gasoline station and there's a hydrogen pump. I believe you're also asking about the stack. Um, you can change individual cells out. That's not an issue at all. What's great about it is that fuel cells are not toxic. Um, we don't have issues with end of life. And yeah, we can get comparable range. Would you like me to answer it anymore? No, because I won't be able to comprehend anymore. But <laughs> uh, no, that actually answered the question because that's exactly what I was asking. It, you know, how fast would it be? Is it something that we're very familiar with right now? So that's it. Absolutely. And, and uh, Madam Chair, as soon as I for the record, um, something that uh, I think Mr. Uh, Alonzo said, and that is hydrogen fuel cell and EVs. And so it's important for the committee to understand that technology has already been deployed. Uh, and so the new hybrid, right now we have uh, gas, uh, gasoline internal combustible engines uh, plus uh, lithium batteries. Uh, all the car manufacturers are moving to the hybrid that will be EV and hydrogen. I guess the other, excuse me, the other reason I was asking is because I know that the military is also looking at uh, this as a potential uh, use, um, and so I, I can't imagine the military wanting something that is cumbersome and that, it, you know, it's something that's quick and, and, and efficient. Senator yeah. Spearman, for the, re for the record, um, and yes, the military, and I neglected to say that in my uh, opening remarks, uh, they're at Nellis, they're already experimenting with light trucks. And uh, throughout the military, they're looking at hydrogen as another way to make sure that we're not sending our treasure, um, men and women, into war uh, to guard and to make sure that fossil fuels get to where they are. Um, when I was working on my uh, doctoral dissertation, I, I wanted to find out how costly the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were. And I'm not talking about money. Uh, but six out of every 10 deaths that took place in Iraq and Afghanistan 
were related to guarding, offloading, uh, convoying of uh, fossil fuels. Six out of every 10 deaths. When you hear IED, improvised explosive device, that, that's a bomb that was made with, with uh, fossil fuels. And so the military, before, even before I left the Pentagon in 2006, uh, every service, the Army, the Navy, the Marines, though they're part of the Navy, uh, Coast Guard, uh, Air Force, every service had an office of energy. And they were already looking forward because we understand that, that the strategic uh, end state of looking at all of these renewables will mean that we will have less wars there'll be less people dying, and we will be more efficient with what we do. And it's important to understand that when you start talking about energy, it's not just flipping a light switch, it's not just driving, but energy right now is currency. And so hydrogen is part of the strategic initiative that Department of Defense is using. So as we wean off of fossil fuels, we can, we can move to something that has been proven safe and effective. Um, just uh, Roxana Beck Mohammadi, for the record again, thank you again, um, Senator, for your service. You know, I didn't bring up national security here, but I will tell you that the Department of Energy, uh, sorry, the Department of Defense has been investing in fuel cells, including electrolyzers and hydrogen technology for over 70 years. A lot of our technology that is deployed in the commercial sector now is because of those early uh, investments. We've seen that as a way, yes, to um, create a uh, distributed fuel abroad. Uh, but also, what I would like to let you all know is that the U.S. Army, at this point, has said that hydrogen is our next tactical fuel. So the question is, are we going to produce it domestically, or are we going to rely on our allies? So I want to tell you that hydrogen is key to our national security, as well as energy security, with respect to the cybersecurity threats that we're uh, facing. All right. Um, we will go to the phones now for testimony in support of Senate Bill 451. If you would like to testify in support of Senate Bill 451, please press star nine or raise hand within Zoom to take your place in the queue. Good afternoon, members of the committee. I'm Sydney Kruger, the managing partner of KTC. And I call in today to express our support position on SB 451. We are very excited about this bill. Hydrogen is a critical feature of a decarbonized energy and transportation future. Kruger Transport LLC thanks you, Senator Spearman, for recognizing the immediate need to incorporate clean hydrogen into Nevada's energy strategy. Mm -hmm. KTC is working with two transit agencies in Nevada, Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada, Las Vegas, and Regional Transportation Commission of Washoe County, Reno, who are deploying fuel cell electric buses. Both believe that to enable a carbon-free society, hydrogen must be part of the solution. Nevada is already leading the way in clean hydrogen transit deployments in the United States, deploying into revenue service fuel cell electric buses powered by hydrogen and enabling clean, quiet, and reliable buses to pick up passengers and move them from point A to B. Fuel cell buses are refueled in 6 to 12 minutes and give ranges over, over 350 miles. What will assist transit's mission is a yes on this bill. At KTC, we're a small consulting firm with over 40 years of experience in transit, as well as experience in the clean energy sector, which includes an emphasis on hydrogen and fuel cell technology. The impacts of climate change are a major concern to KTC. From wildfires to sea level rise and removing carcinogenic emissions, KTC is dedicated to supporting, to supporting bills like this, which take aggressive action to mitigate these impacts including transitioning fleets around Nevada and the United States to zero emission fuel cell buses powered by clean hydrogen 
and improving transit infrastructure through building hydrogen dis dispensing stations at depots. This bill is consistent with KTC's goals that support reducing greenhouse gases, promoting zero emission vehicles, creating green jobs, and enabling energy independence. KTC respectfully asks for your yes vote for SB 451, as written with the federal definition of clean hydrogen. KTC strongly encourages the Senate committee to support this project, and we look forward to the multiple benefits this bill will bring to the Nevada community. community. Thank you so much. Hello, uh, my name is Belen Gallego, that is B-E-L-E-N-G-A-L-L-E-G-O, -E and my company is called Renmar by ETA Insights, and I am calling to also support this bill. Uh, we follow all major energy technologies that help us uh, help our planet reach the world towards decarbonization. We are very excited about this bill, and we have been working in promoting hydrogen in Nevada and Nevada as a meeting point for hydrogen industry for a few months now. In fact, we are organizing an event uh, in July 12th and 13th, which will take place at the Palace Station Hotel, uh, where we will cover all the topics uh, of the hydrogen, uh, covering from regulation, financing, design and projects, and so on and so forth. And for some months now, we've been working to bring the attention to the great suitability of Nevada to become a massive hydrogen uh, hub. For all of the reasons that we've already heard from uh, my colleagues on the phone, uh, from Roxana Beke Mohammadi, Ed Garcia, and even Senator Spearman, uh, about the amounts of uh, investment that we're talking about, about the forward thinking industry, the jobs that it brings. Also because Nevada is uh, positioned in a key location where it has the option and the ability to work in, in change many uh, industries in other states as well. Therefore, the huge uh, opportunity that it represents uh, unlocks uh, great federal financing, creates jobs, and most importantly, puts Nevada at the forefront of the future industry. Uh, as I said, for a few months we've been working on this already, and uh, all of the main hydrogen players uh, in in the U.S. will take place in our event in July, and they will discuss all these issues. And for example, some of the event, the companies that will be present will be in the Energy, Duke Energy, uh, the Nevada Clean Energy Fund, uh, Berkeley Labs, uh, EDP, um, Plug Power, Siemens, NREL, Kukum, PG&E, Obsidian. Uh, and so on and so forth. So um, for that reason, I think we, we look forward uh, to go to, to the passing of this. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Chloe Chisholm, that's C-H-I-S-M, and I'm the Government Relations Advisor for NB Energy. We're here today in support of SB 451. The research and development of clean hydrogen will help Nevada reach our renewable energy and carbon reduction goals while also providing our customers with new and innovative energy solutions. We would like to thank Senator Spearman for her leadership on this issue and urge the committee to support SB 451. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon, Chair Harris and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Thomas Lawson, and I am the Government Affairs Regional Director for Ford Motor Company. I cover 13 states in the Western Region, and we are here to uh, show our support for SB 451. As the market leader in the commercial vehicle space, we are beginning to explore the role that hydrogen-powered vehicles can play in the clean vehicle ecosystem. In March of 2022, Ford was awarded a $25 million matching grant from the Department of Energy to advance the use of high-efficiency fuel cells for medium-duty vehicles. This project will help us develop and pilot 
Zev Fuel Cell Super Duty vehicles for vacation applications. With partners such as uh, NREL, Consumer Energy, Ferguson, and SoCal Gas, we will receive real-world feedback on fuel cell usage and efficiency, durability, refueling, and operating costs. We strongly believe that the medium and heavy-duty sectors are the right application for hydrogen-powered vehicles, and fleets that use these types of vehicles need them to be able to respond to an emergency 24-7. For them, uptime is extremely critical, and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles allow for fueling within minutes. We believe that targeting these sectors are equally critical to helping us significantly reduce our GHG emissions and provide clean transportation alternatives. While we are still in the early stages of our pilot, we do see some hurdles that we are observing to the deployment and adoption of hydrogen vehicles, and the biggest hurdle is the lack of infrastructure. We believe active build-out of hydrogen infrastructure sends signals to the fleet so that they can begin to inquire and invest in purchasing these vehicles, which leads to manufacturers developing and offering more models. Other states have built their stations focused on light-duty vehicles, and most of those are limited to fueling tanks less than 10 kilograms. The vocational vehicles that I mentioned earlier are going to be out and about in our communities, so they will need to fill up in those same communities. And so it's important that those uh, stations have the capacity to fill tanks that are 20 kilograms to 30 kilograms. And by doing this, you'll be able to future-proof the significant investment by the state and the private sector in these hydrogen fueling stations. In conclusion, I want to thank for the opportunity. We want to thank uh, Senator Spearman for her uh, leadership in this, and we have uh, just three recommendations I think we'd like to leave with folks, which is to ensure that the public funded stations include the capacity to fill 20 to 30 kilogram tanks, provide funding to help current stations uh, upgrade to be able to fill that, that amount, 20 to 30 kilograms, and then obviously providing monetary and non-monetary uh, incentives for fleets of all sizes to purchase hydrogen-powered vehicles. Thank you for your time, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak on this bill. Hello, folks. Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. Good afternoon, Chair Harris and members of the committee. My name is Michael Lord, L-O-R-D, and I'm an executive engineer for Toyota Motor North America. And I would like to testify in wholehearted support for SB 451. This bill will promote the production and usage of hydrogen, which will be particularly important in the transportation sector as a fuel for fuel cell electric vehicles. Toyota believes in a portfolio approach to vehicle electrification, including BEV, battery electric vehicles, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, and of course, fuel cell electric vehicles. And we have each type of vehicle in the market right now in the U.S. Um, as it relates to fuel cell electric vehicles, they have particular benefits in the market. They have very long range, fast refueling, and yes, they can be filled just like a conventional vehicle in three to five minutes. And they work well in hot and cold weather. I think it was noted by a previous testifier that uh, they're, they're also a very good ZEV option for folks that do not do not have convenient charging at home, particularly or people that don't have a parking spot with a charger parking on the street or in apartment buildings and multi-unit dwellings. Uh, Toyota is in uh, our second generation of fuel cell electric vehicle. Uh, the first generation had 312 miles, the second has 402. Um, there's over 11,000 vehicles on the road, Mirai vehicles on the road in, in California where the infrastructure exists, and we would hope to be able to bring them into Nevada as infrastructure is built out there. We also have a project, uh, Project Portal. We've done a, 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 a project with the Port of LA with 10 heavy-duty Class A truck, 80,000 pound, using two of our fuel cell systems from the Toyota Mirai, and we've just announced uh, certification of a unit for uh, those heavy duty trucks to be used uh, for future applications. Uh, I just wanna thank uh, Senator Spearman for uh, this bill and uh, thank you uh, for your time.
Chair, there are no additional callers choosing to provide testimony at this time. Okay, thank you. We'll go ahead and turn now to testimony in opposition. Is there anyone here in Carson City who'd like to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 451? Come on up, fill the seats. Let Ms. Dykema go right behind you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Harris and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christy cabrera Georgeson, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Nevada Conservation League. We're here in opposition of SB 451. NCL has serious concerns with overcommitting to hydrogen, which is unproven and impractical at large scale. Hydrogen is incompatible with existing gas infrastructure and is potentially dangerous. There is currently no available technology to safely convert methane gas facilities to run on 100% hydrogen, and annual explosions would more than quadruple if hydrogen were to replace gas in our homes. In the transportation sector, electric vehicle technology far surpasses hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. In 2020, there were fewer than 8,000 fuel cell vehicles being driven in the United States, and there are currently no fuel cell trucks available. We also have concerns with the definition of clean hydrogen used in this bill and believe it's too vague and may allow for some non-green hydrogen to be used. Right now, more than 99% of hydrogen is produced from fossil fuels, such as natural gas, which studies show produces more pollution than simply burning gas alone. Oil refineries are the main producers of hydrogen and communities living in close proxim proximity bear, bear the brunt of this air pollution. Even green hydrogen hydrogen is inefficient as it requires significant water and electricity resources. Experts agree that the small amount of truly green hydrogen we may be able to develop in the future will be precious and should only be used for hard to electrify sectors such as aviation and heavy industry. We've submitted a letter to Nellis as well as a fact sheet that goes into more details as to why hydrogen is a false solution to cut pollution from Nevada's buildings and transportation sectors. We urge the committee to oppose this bill. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Angie Dykema and I'm here on behalf of SWEEP, the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project. We are in opposition to SB 451 because we believe Nevada should generally focus on the development of our domestic renewable resources instead of promoting development of hydrogen. The specific components that are problematic in this bill is that there are higher tiers of hydrogen production and the definition here is not clear. And there's also no mention of environmental impacts of hydrogen production. Directing our agencies to focus on hydrogen production without limitation, as described in this bill, is too broad and counter to the progress we've already made with our own abundance of proven, cost-effective renewable resources that do not pose as much of a risk to develop. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sam Anastasados, that's spelled A-N-A-S-T-A-S-S-A-T-O-S, -S -S of the Griffin Company. I'm testifying here today on behalf of the Natural Resource Defense Council and the Environmental Defense Action Fund. The NRDC and uh, EDF Action are opposed to SB 451 as currently drafted. Hydrogen is a key solution to decarbonizing hard to electrify sectors, but is a serious climate risk if implemented without adequate guardrails. SB 451 purports to incentivize clean hydrogen to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but hydrogen is a potent indirect ga uh, greenhouse gas in its own right. Research shows that hydrogen has a high leakage rate and that and there is virtually no real-world data to inform best practice on how to mitigate and monitor hydrogen leakage. When released into the atmosphere, hydrogen causes chemical reactions that exacerbate the damaging effects of other harmful greenhouse gases like methane. Furthermore, producing either green or blue hydrogen, both of which may be considered clean under the standards adopted by this bill is incredibly energy intensive. For instance, data reveals that green hydrogen, which is pr uh, produced using renewable energy, requires on average three to seven times more energy than direct electrification. This makes the use of hydrogen only potentially practical for hard to decarbonize sectors like heavy industry. Steel making, long haul shipping and aviation, and high temperature industrial processes are all potentially good uses of hydrogen because they are hard to electrify. SB 451 does not account for this in its list of permissible uses of hydrogen. Furthermore, green, house, uh, green hydrogen 
is only truly green if it is produced using new dedicated zero carbon resources that are hourly matched. That is, the electricity is used in the same hour it is generated on the same load balance area of the grid that it is generated. Otherwise, electrolytic hydrogen is two to five times more carbon intensive than gray fossil based hydrogen. SB 451 expressly states that permissible uses are listed without limitation. Under this wording, even blending hydrogen with natural gas could be considered a permissible use. This could significantly undermine the emissions reduction and community health goals suggested by this bill. Hydrogen is, has the potential to delay or derail much of the much more efficient decarbonization solutions, particularly in buildings and transportation, where electrification is much more efficient. For example, it would take approximately five times the amount of renewable energy to heat homes via green, uh, green hydrogen boilers than via heat pumps. For vehicles, it would take three times more renewable energy to run fuel cell vehicles on green hydrogen compared to battery electric vehicles. It is not appropriate to give broad Sir, directives. you're at about two minutes and 40 seconds, which Sorry. is more than I've given others. It's okay you. if you could just wrap up, and you're also free to please submit your written comments to the right. committee as well. Okay. Um, uh, for these reasons, EDF Action and NRDC oppose SB 451. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Harris, members of the committee. For the record, Patrick Donnelly. I'm Great Basin Director with the Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, we oppose this bill. I would echo many of the comments made earlier by Ms. Cabrera. Um, uh, I would focus just a bit on the definition of clean hydrogen in the bill. Um, it allows for four kilograms of CO2 equivalent per one kilogram of hydrogen. This pretty explicitly would allow for fossil fuel derived hydrogen, uh, so-called blue hydrogen. And so this bill could uh, uh, sort of counterintuitively allow for the continued use or expansion of the current uh, fossil fuel industry. That includes gas, methane gas, which generally is produced with fracking, uh, a, a uh, destructive form of uh, uh, fossil fuel extraction. And so this bill could actually promote uh, more methane gas production, more fracking, um, which would be very harmful. Uh, a, clean, uh, a clean hydrogen definition of one kilogram of CO2 equivalent per one kilogram of hydrogen would then focus this strictly on green hydrogen, that is hydrogen developed from water using renewable energy. And so uh, that should really be the focus if we are even to embark on a hydrogen project. Um, uh, it really should focus on green hydrogen derived from renewable energy and not allow the continued use of fossil fuels. Thank you. All right, uh, Las Vegas, testimony in opposition to Senate Bill 451. Go ahead and uh, state your name and spell it for the record. Begin when you're ready. Hello, thank you for having us. My name is Pastor Marlon Anderson. That's M-A-R-L-O-N-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. And I am the Clean Energy um, Community Organizer for Faith Organizing Alliance. Um, our mission at FOA is to increase civic participation through faith-based and civic organizations within the Las Vegas Valley to advance a community and government that is more caring, just, and equitable. Um, regarding this bill, FOA has serious concerns about the word clean hydrogen and opposes SB 451 until further studies are conducted. Uh, we testified about hydrogen in a bill that would have added clean hydrogen to the renewable portfolio standard. Um, and our concerns about hydrogen have not changed since then. Um, there's still a lot to learn, including how clean it can be made, how it can be safely transported, and how affordable it is to use. <clears throat> it is not the silver bullet solution that utilities or the industry would have us to believe, and right now the vast majority of it is far from clean. Additionally, the process of making hydrogen is highly water intensive and unsustainable for Nevada. Um, though we appreciate the bill's sponsor's intentions, we do not support legislation that embraces hydrogen on a large scale. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to share our concerns. Thank you. All right, thank you. We'll go ahead and go to the phone lines. BPS, anyone on the phone to testify in opposition? If you would like to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 451, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Oh. 
Hello. Go ahead and begin when you're ready. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is Chris Bell. That's C H R A S B E L L, calling in from Reno. Uh, Chair Harris and members of the committee, uh, I'm a volunteer member of the Sierra Club's Legislative Committee. On behalf of the club, the world's largest volunteer environmental volunteer organization, and our more than 30,000 members and supporters statewide, I'm speaking in opposition of SB 451. We appreciate the efforts being made in Nevada to move to renewable energy, free of fossil fuels and CO2 emissions. We are enthusiastic about the parts of this bill that encourage partnerships and collaboration to study hydrogen technology and how it can best be utilized in our economy. Furthermore, we agree that hydrogen has a role to play in this clean, clean energy future. However, there are many pitfalls in using hydrogen as a fuel source, and this bill falls victim to some of these pitfalls. Firstly, hydrogen should only be considered as a future power source if it is produced from renewable energy, electricity, and is therefore genuinely green, as defined in Senator Spearman's current bill, SB 334. The green hydrogen definition from SB 334 should be referenced here, and green, en and green energy, as defined in that bill, should be the standard for hydrogen here in SB 451. Additionally, we think it's premature to incentivize the, quote, production, processing, delivery, storage, and use of hydrogen without limitation, unquote. Since generating hydrogen is extremely energy inefficient and consumes considerable amounts of water, we believe that in Nevada, it is best to focus hydrogen on those industries that cannot be practically electrified. We would advise that hydrogen not be used as a fuel in light and medium duty vehicles, but may well be useful be used in heavy industries currently reliant on fossil fuels where electrification is impractical or impossible. For these reasons, we oppose this bill. The Sierra Club could support the bill if it is amended to require green hydrogen rather than clean hydrogen and eliminate the promotion of unlimited applications of green hydrogen and be judicious in promoting use of Nevada's precious water. Thank you. Hello, members of the Senate Growth Infrastructure Committee. Uh, my name is Jamari Young Williams, and I am the Government Affairs Manager for Western Resource Advocates. Uh, WRA is a regional nonprofit organization fighting climate change and its impacts to sustain the environment, economy, and people of the West. Uh, I am here today to oppose uh, Senate Bill 451. The primary reason why WRA opposes this bill is because of its use of the federal definition of clean hydrogen. The federal definition of clean hydrogen allows for the use of production from diverse energy sources, which may include fossil fuels. This bill also frames clean hydrogen as a tool that will cut greenhouse gas emissions without acknowledging that this definition of hydrogen may actually contribute to greenhouse gas emissions to the state, prolonging our reliance on fossil fuels. We are also equally concerned with the directive that Nevada state agencies pr promote the use of hydrogen uh, without including language stating that they will equally consider other forms of energy that may be more cost effective and better at cutting greenhouse gas emissions. It will be more effective to propose language that requires the agencies to evaluate all options capable of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, including the cost of different options and greenhouse gas reduction potential. Uh, WRA, we also find the language promoting clean hydrogen for uh, a wide variety of zero emission vehicles to be a bit problematic uh, for uh, hydrogen based vehicles over battery electric vehicles. Battery, battery electric, uh, sorry, battery electric vehicles, can't speak today, are cheaper, more readily available, have fueling infrastructure that's available in the state, while fuel cell technology holds promise for certain transport. Uh, transportation applications in the future, there are zero hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and in, um, in zero hydrogen refueling stations in Nevada. Uh, battery electric vehicles are readily available for light, medium, and heavy duty vehicle applications with over 33,000 vehicles deployed and over 1,000 charging stations deployed across the state. Hydrogen powered transportation may hold some promise in the future, 
but should not be prioritized over battery electric uh, technology. And for these reasons, WRA opposes Senate Bill 451. Good afternoon, Chair Harris and members of the committee. My name is Gabriella Olmedo, O-L-M-E-D-O. -E I'm an associate at Advanced Energy United, a, a business association working to make the energy we use clean, affordable, and reliable. We represent over 100 companies in the diverse advanced energy industry, such as large-scale renewables, geothermal, energy storage, energy efficiency, and electric vehicles. I'm calling in opposition to SB 451. While Advanced Energy United supports the use of hydrogen as part of a 100% clean energy economy, especially for hard to decarbonize sectors, such as certain industrial processes, we are not supportive of a blanket directive to promote hydrogen for any and all applications as is put forward in this bill. Clean hydrogen applications must be rigorously compared with the other solutions that can meet the same defined need and should not be prioritized in areas where there are other affordable and proven solutions such as light duty transportation or space heating. This bill would create an undue preference to promote hydrogen wherever possible, tilting otherwise neutral analyses in favor of a resource that may end up being higher cost or a higher risk option. Because hydrogen is relatively new, it is not yet clear how expensive and scarce this resource will be. Its use should prioritize applications where other commercially viable clean energy alternatives are lacking, such as industrial use. This topic would benefit from very careful consideration of how to best apply this resource in Nevada. Importantly, we support the production of use and use of hydrogen consistent with our mission to power our economy with 100% clean energy. The definition in this bill allows for hydrogen production that is not fully clean. Hydrogen will have a vital role to play in our energy system including the microgrids and other distributed energy resources and industrial applications as noted in this bill. And while we do not support this bill at this time, we look forward to a clean energy future in which we put hydrogen solutions to their best and most valuable use. This requires prioritizing applications supported by robust analysis considered across all alternatives to arrive at the best solution for an affordable and resilient clean energy future. Thank you for your consideration. Good afternoon, Chair Harris and committee members. My name is Kelly Trombley and I'm speaking on behalf of Ceres. Ceres is a nonprofit sustainability organization working with the country's most influential and uh, companies and investors to build a more sustainable global economy. And I appreciate the opportunity today to testify about several significant concerns we have with Senate Bill 451. The companies and investors in Ceres networks see climate change as a significant business risk and reducing carbon emissions as an economic opportunity. To make progress on these commitments, businesses need access to clean, renewable energy. We are concerned that the definition of clean hydrogen in this bill includes other sources besides green hydrogen. The process to access hydrogen can be expensive and may ultimately result in significant carbon emissions. And we know that beyond the serious challenges remaining to sourcing green hydrogen, only certain use cases for hydrogen make economic sense. Lastly, production, storage, and transportation must be carefully considered before investing significant resources into its development and implementation without limitation, as this bill indicates. Nevada has abundant clean energy resources such as solar, wind, and geothermal at its disposal and an RPS that puts Nevada in a leadership position. It makes economic sense to accelerate transportation, electrification, and energy efficiency resources now so that Nevada is poised to lead when green hydrogen technology, which will need additional clean energy sources, makes sense for hard to abate sectors. We must ensure that we are investing in the most viable and effective clean energy solutions, and thus we urge the committee to further consider the implications that this bill would have on Nevada's clean energy commitments in the economy at large and oppose this bill. Thank you so much for your time.
Chair, there are no additional callers to provide testimony at this time. Okay, uh, we will go on to neutral testimony. Anyone here in Carson City? Okay, anyone in Las Vegas to testify in the neutral position? Not seeing anyone, BPS, can you please uh, check for neutral testimony? If you would like to testify in neutral for Senate Bill 451, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Okay, uh, Senator Spearman, wanna make some closing comments? Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members for um, listening. And I just want to correct a couple of things that were said, um, that hydrogen is new here. Um, and for those who are afraid of how it will be transported, too late, because Air Liquide is producing it and will transport it from Nevada to California. Uh, there are other um, areas of uh, hydrogen use that are already here in the state. And my point with this um, bill is that it's already here. And, and one, of the re one of the reasons we don't know, I sat right where you sit right now, Madam Chair, when I was uh, chair of the Subcommittee on Energy in 20, 2017. And I said at that time that hydrogen was coming and we should probably start preparing for it. So that's number one. Number two, we're not prioritizing hydrogen over anything else. Number three, uh, 10 years ago, the cost of EVs was uh, prohibited for people who were of modest means. Um, in 2016, I was fortunate enough to um, be recommended by Senator Reed to go to NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab, and I would encourage anyone who wants to learn more about um, how energy is um, affecting, being produced, and researched. It's um, uh, PhDs there, science, scientific PhDs there. and. Um, Towards the end of the course, uh, they said, we can now show you something that we have been researching for the last 25 years, and um, said something to the effect, you all are among the first classes that will be able to take advantage of this more than 25 year research. Uh, and that was driving hydrogen fuel cell cars. Uh, they also talked about other ways that hydrogen was going to come in, um, into play more and more in everyday life. Um, so that's there, and um, I want to I want to read something to you um, because you know <laughs> six out of every ten deaths, and I can't emphasize that as much as you know enough, were attributed to fossil fuels. And if anybody thinks that that the military or Department of Defense was not motivated in the early two thousands to make sure that we were, we were not sending our prized possessions, men and women, into war for this. Uh, oh, and I forgot to say something else at the onset. Um, right now, um, I can't afford an EV, so I still drive an um, internal combustible engine. Guess what? 21 billion gallons of oil, crude oil, come through the Straits of Harmouth every day. Guess how much that costs us? $1.2 billion. And you, you know who the primary security force is for that? The US Navy. And, and, and they do that because we have not yet weaned ourselves off of fossil fuels. But the other thing that's happening, um, and I'll, I'll give you this, the US Department of Energy and US Army co collaborate to develop hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Um, the Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy announces a collaboration with the Department of Defense, U.S. Army Ground Vehicle Systems Center, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to develop and demonstrate H2, that's hydrogen rescue powered emergency fuel trucks. And so it may be new to Nevada, but it's not new. 
Th th this, is, this has been researched over and over and over again. The point of Senate Bill 40, 451 is to say, if we are going to get to 50% by 2030, I, you know, the only thing I ever heard, pe I heard people talk about in opposition was electrification, electrification. I'm all for that. I am all for that. And anybody who doubts that, I would just ask you to go to the um, HBO documentary, uh, Coming, uh, Renewable Energy, The Renewable Energy Revolution with Jamie Redford. And the last five frames of that documentary is me talking about solar and how we can use solar here in Nevada to start weaning ourselves off of fossil fuels. I mean, I made some other comments too in the, in the documentary. So this isn't an attack on electrification. What it is is the recognition that electrification alone will not get us there. And if electrification alone would get us there, you wouldn't hear people talking about geothermal. Incidentally, if we were more um, aggressive in developing geothermal resources here in Nevada, we could save, I don't know, maybe hundreds of billions of dollars because there's only one other state that has more geothermal than Nevada, and that's California. So we have geothermal here, but we haven't done anything with that. And the bill that I bought in 2017 to try to make sure we added that as one of the resources never made it out of the assembly. And it never made it out of the assembly, and I was trying to make sure that we got that legislation passed because Department of Energy had narrowed down two states that were in the running to be awarded the Forward Observatory Research for Geothermal Energy, FORGE. And that was one of the last projects that Senator Reid worked on uh, before he left the Senate. Couldn't get it out. Guess who, guess who got awarded that project? Utah. And they don't have near the amount of geothermal that we have. And so, you know, simply what I'm saying here is that um, we're not saying it's got to be a priority. And for those who don't want it in Nevada, too late. It's already here. It's already here in southern Nevada, and there's some development that's going on in northern Nevada. And uh, Sacramento is only two and a half hours away, and they're deploying it in, in big measures. So I, I, I want Roxana to address the, um, the theory that, that hydrogen uh, is going to blow up. It's exciting, but not as explosive as people think. Um, Roxana beck Mahomedy, for the record, there's a couple of things I would like to address. Yes, um, hydrogen is thought of as being explosive. It actually is uh, actually safer than a number of fuels. The reason for that is our liquid fuels like diesel and whatnot, gasoline, they pool. Um, so this has to do with chemical properties. That is actually very dangerous. We see runaway chemical reactions in battery electric vehicles, which is... Uh, very difficult to put out. You can ask any first responder or watch any video online. Um, with propane or methane, uh, it is light, it diffuses, but it's not as light as hydrogen. Hydrogen is the lightest element on, on, on the periodic table in the universe. So it diffuses very, very quickly. So it's actually less of a concern than people would like to think. Another thing is that Hydrogen has always existed and thrives in the heavy duty um, and large scale applications. So to say that it hasn't been done safely is absolutely inaccurate. You could ask any refinery that's util utilizing hydrogen at large scale to remove sulfur from our fuels. Um, I also wanted to mention really quickly, you know, we do see the advent of battery electric vehicles and I want to say that's a sister to fuel cell electric vehicles, and they're the same type of technology. They're just electrochemical devices. With fuel cell electric vehicles, you just have the fuel outside, unlike the battery. Um, the reason why you see the greater adoption of battery electric vehicles is there's an existing infrastructure. We can rely on our, electric, uh, our electrical grid. Adding a charger isn't that expensive, but you have to put one at a time. So battery electric vehicles are doing well, but at, at smaller scale adoption where we're going to see once we get to massive adoption, it's going to be very difficult. Um, so I just wanted to address that, you know, we see uh, electric utilities that are putting in the chargers. We don't really have that. We haven't been enabling our gas utilities to do similar things to enable infrastructure. Um, the one other thing I just wanted to mention, there's a couple of just a lot of misinformation to be frank. Um, actually, you can buy fuel cell electric trucks now, and I would encourage you to ask Anheuser-Busch, Anheuser um, Walmart, 
Amazon because they're buying them, they already have. So these technologies are commercially available now. Uh, not to mention that RTC North and South have buses already. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I respectfully disagree with um, um, my colleagues, uh, and we can disagree without being disagreeable, but this is, this is one of the things, if we stick our head in the sand, by the time you all get back here in 2025, the world would have left us behind. Uh, there is a convention that's coming to um, Las Vegas in July, July the 12th, I think it is, to the 14th. Uh, and I was on a webinar this morning uh, with them talking about it, and someone from Europe uh, made this comment. They said, um, Nevada is um, ground zero for the expansion of renewable energy, and that includes hydrogen. The question is, does Nevada know what they have? This is RENMAD H2 USA conference in 2023, July 12th through the 13th, Las Vegas. How to design, build, finance, and operate profitable green hydrogen projects in the US. We can get hung up about the definition if we want to, but hydrogen in all of their definitions, in all of the definitions, is already here. What 451 is trying to do is take us out of the dinosaur age and make sure we move forward and we capitalize on, especially on the money that's already out there, the money that's already out there. So that's, that, that's really all I have to say. And Thanks, I will commend Sarah. to you all the, the, the National Renewable Energy Lab. I will commend that to you and I'll make sure that you get the link uh, and the Center for Naval Analysis which is a, it's an independent national security and strategic organization that has white papers that talks about this. And so I would commend that to you uh, so that you can, you can learn what hydrogen is all about uh, in the last five or six years and not the last 20. Thank you, Vice Chair Spearman. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Senate Bill 451 and open up the hearing on AB 144. Sorry, Mr. Sever, you got, you got booted. Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch, welcome. Go ahead and take your time and uh, begin when you're ready, okay? The committee also has copies of the report at their desk. And for folks following along at home, um, this presentation is also available on Nellis, but we've got it up on the screen now. All right. Well, um, thank you, Chair and, and committee, for inviting me here today. I am Assemblymember LaRue Hatch. I represent uh, District 25 in Northwest Reno, and I am here to present AB 144, which is all about fluorescent lamps and mercury and keeping our consumers safe. And I am going to allow my co-presenter to go ahead and introduce himself as well. Yes, good afternoon, Chair Harris and members of the committee. My name is Brian Fady, last name spelled F-A-D-I-E, and I am the state policy manager at the Appliance Standards Awareness Project. And Selena LaRue Hatch, for the record, I am a teacher, so I have a PowerPoint, but I promise we're going to go through it quickly. I really just wanted you to be able to have those materials so you can review them. Before we jump into this, this bill is very technical. There's a lot of technical language throughout. And so I wanted to make sure we explained the term lamp 
as we use it throughout the bill because it is not necessarily a standing lamp or light fixture as we imagined. So I'll allow Brian to explain that briefly. Yeah, we just want to make sure folks are aware when you see the term lamp used in the bill, that's actually uh, what we more commonly think of as the light bulb. It's a lamp is an industry term to refer to the light bulb. Uh, most people though, in our everyday lives, you might hear the term lamp and think of the whole sort of fixture that sits on your desk or what have you, but uh, just wanted to clarify, there were some questions about that previously. And Assemblymember LaRue Hatch for the record. So we want to talk about some of the issues with fluorescent lamps. Many people are not aware, but traditional fluorescent lamps contain mercury, which is a toxic chemical, and that chemical poses a safety hazard to our communities because if you have it in your house and it breaks, you're exposed to it, but just as importantly, our waste workers are being exposed to it. If they're not properly disposed of, it's going into our landfills, that's seeping into our water, and I would imagine most people, or at least the people I've talked to, don't know that there's a specific way that you have to dispose of mercury lamps. They just, their lamp burns out, they put it in the trash and they move on. And that is a, a serious health issue. It is also for our um, builders, it is also very expensive to haul away mercury lamps. There's actually, you have to pay someone to come in and dispose of it for you because there are all of these issues associated with the, the health and the safety. Brian, did you want to add anything or did I pretty much cover that? For the record, Brian Fady, uh, that was great. Yes, absolutely. All right, we're going to continue then. Uh, the other part of our fluorescent lamps is that they cost more money to operate and they cost more in our carbon footprint. And so by switching to LEDs, the consumer saves significant amounts of money. The LEDs last longer than the fluorescents. Obviously, they don't contain mercury, which is great for everybody, and they use less electricity. So as we were just talking about our renewables and reducing the amount um, of energy that we need, this is one of those steps that we can take. And I provided to the committee some charts on our one pager that show just how much cost savings we have. Um, and I think Brian can go into that just a little bit, the cost savings and the mercury savings and the carbon savings. Yeah, for the record, Brian Fady, um, my organization, we conducted market research that helped underpin this policy idea. Uh, we estimate in the year 2030, uh, should this bill take effect, um, the Nevada statewide utility bill savings would be about $19 million per year. And from that also, there'd be about 7.7 .7 pounds of mercury avoided every year from the lamps not shipping into the state and about 269 gigawatt hours of electricity saved every year from making the switch to LEDs. So Assemblymember LaRue Hatch for the record. So going into what this bill actually does, in January 2025, it would prohibit the sale or distribution of compact fluorescent lamps. So if you look at this slide, you can see it's the screw base, um, the little curly Q lamps that we all know and maybe love or not. And the second phase out would be in January 2026. That would be the linear lamps. Those are the ones that are probably above our heads right now. And then it includes certain exemptions because we know that there are certain industries that are reliant on these and there may not be an LED replacement. So we put an, a list of exemptions and there's photocopying, printing, um, film. We specifically also put lamps that are used in uh, in vehicles because there are some vehicles produced in the past that use these little tiny fluorescent lamps that you can't really get an LED replacement for. And then we wanted to make very clear these are not grow lamps that are used in the cannabis industry. We're not trying to phase those out. We really are trying to phase out um, household and industrial use and protect our consumers. And then one of the most important things that I want to make clear that this bill does not do, it does not require anyone to change out their current light bulbs or fixtures. If you have fluorescent lamps in your home or in your business, they can stay there. It's just that starting in 2025 when your lamp burns out and you go to Home Depot to get a new one, 
you will only be able to find LEDs on the shelf. So you don't have to change those out. Um, as far as we know, you don't have to change out the actual fixtures. There are LED replacement bulbs that fit into all the current fixtures. So this shouldn't be a heavy consumer burden. We just wanna make sure that people cannot purchase something that is toxic to them on the store shelves. And then I'm gonna allow Brian to speak to some of the replacements that are available and why we really need this law to help us that, with that transition. Yes, again, for the record, Brian Beatty. Um, so this really kind of speaks to the question of why this bill is needed. And as mentioned, my organization conducted market research. We estimate that this year in Nevada, about 1.8 million fluorescent light bulbs will be shipped into the state. And each one of those contains mercury. So each one of those uh, represents a potential health hazard if they break, uh, if they break in a school setting, in an office setting, in any other setting you know, during the waste management process. And a mercury vapor gets released when, when fluorescents break. And that becomes a, a pretty serious health hazard for anybody that's around it. So there's still millions of uh, the fluorescent lamps being shipped into the state. Um, and this is a way to put a stop to that inflow of mercury waste that is coming into the state while also saving energy, saving on utility bills, uh, just a lot of positives there. I'll also note um, the fluorescents that we're talking about here they are no longer manufactured in the United States. It made the transition to overseas manufacturing uh, years ago, so no jobs would be impacted by the bill. However, other states are now ending the sales of these fluorescents, uh, such as California, which passed the same policy last year. So Nevada, you don't want to become a dumping ground for these mercury-containing products, the fluorescent lamps. Uh, LEDs are now widely available and cost effective as uh, replacements. Uh, there's a picture on, I believe on the side of the screen now, the, the cover of the report uh, my organization published last year detailing these findings, which I believe was uh, submitted to the committee. So with that, I'll turn it back to Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch and we'll be happy to take any questions. Assemblyman LaRue Hatch for the record, and I would like to point out that while there are no fluorescent lamp manufacturers in the U.S. and certainly not in Nevada, there are LED manufacturers in Nevada. And so by making this switch, we are supporting Nevada businesses. And I would stress that as more and more states ban these lamps, we do not want to become the last state to do so and then become a dumping ground for all of these foreign-made mercury-laden lamps into Nevada. So with that said, we are now ready to stand for questions. Committee members, do we have questions on AB 144? Senator Hansen. Thanks, Madam Chair. Enjoyed your presentation. Um, now, these have a potential danger to workers, obviously. If they break mercury exposures, something you're quite concerned about, why the pass for the marijuana industry then? Don't those workers deserve equal protection? So I'm going to allow Brian to speak to that because I think that there was a difference in the lamp type. And I will let you know, I am not a lamp expert, but he is much more so than I. Great. Love to hear why the marijuana people get a pass, but everybody else is such a major potential health hazard. Yes, thank you, um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Senator Hansen. Uh, as the Assemblywoman discussed earlier, you know, we took a look at the lighting market and we wanted to make sure that for the fluorescents that we were phasing out, there were LEDs available in all the different shapes and sizes of the light bulbs and that they were cost effective for consumers. And uh, you see that there's a number of specific use cases that are exempted in the bill. Um, basically those products, you know, we weren't able to conclude that the LEDs were as widely available and cost effective for those specific use cases. Um, so, you know, the bill limits itself to what's called uh, general purpose white light fluorescence. That's where the LEDs are being most uh, produced across all the different sizes and shapes. Uh, there's still some 
you know, specialty use cases where the LEDs are still advancing. Okay, so you're basically saying the type of lights that they're using now, there's no replacements that would match this? Because it sounds to me like for some reason you're doing an unusual carve-out for one specific industry uh, that doesn't make any sense to me. But we can go on to that in a minute. Normally, now you got 1.8 million of them being shipped into Nevada, so there's apparently still a substantial consumer demand for these. Um, while I do understand that you know you want to go to something potentially safer, normally things like this, uh, you know, I've been in this place seven sessions now. We don't go around outlawing light bulbs or you know headlamps or something like that. It's it's a very unusual thing here to actually come to the legislature and actually insist that we make something that apparently still is a pretty decent market, 1.8 million. And, and pass a law to essentially do what normally would occur naturally through a market process. Because if these are as bad and as dangerous as in, inefficient and uh, more expensive than the ones you're, you're proposing, why wouldn't we just let the marketplace do what it normally would do and that would be, allow them to be phased out with time? Assemblymember uh, LaRue, Hatch for the record. Thank you, Senator, for the question. As a history teacher, I'm going to point out that there have been many products over the years that we thought were okay and are not anymore and are not on the shelf. And it is my belief that it is our job to protect our constituents where it is necessary. I don't know that many individuals that are aware of the mercury danger. My family certainly didn't know about it until I started digging into this. And I think that it is our job to ensure that the products on shelves are not going to harm people. And I would imagine that when constituents go to Home Depot and they buy something, they're going to trust that we have vetted that those things are not going to kill them. Or at the very least, that there's a big warning on them that there is this issue. And so I think that it, it is our job to ensure that safe products are on the shelves. Which I would agree with, but the one that you haven't done in your presentation, you mentioned potential dangers, serious health hazards, major health issues, but I don't see any data backing that up. Are you telling me right now in Nevada that we have, do you have people that have actually been working for the sanitation companies, for example, where they've been exposed to these bulbs being in the dumps for years, that have actually had substantial health risks and, and lost their jobs or even their, their lives because people have been throwing light bulbs in the trash for decades? Yeah, Assemblymember LaRue Hatch for the record. So I have had those conversations with those workers and those individuals who have been exposed and they did express that it was a problem. I will also allow Brian to add on to that because I know he's been looking into this for a long time. Great. Any data you can provide, Brian, I'd love to see it. Yes, thank you for the record, Brian Fady. Um, I believe there might have been two reports that actually uh, were submitted to the committee. There was one, you saw the cover uh, cover of it at the end of the presentation there. There's a second companion report that actually looks specifically at the human health risk from fluorescent light bulbs. And contained within that report are some case studies of different situations, one of which being uh, workers at a landfill facility uh, being overexposed to mercury uh, in their work conditions, in their workspaces. Uh, it wasn't in uh, the state of Nevada, that particular study, uh, but it was a, a documented instance of workers being overexposed to, to mercury um, in their everyday working conditions. Okay, well, yeah, I'd love to see those studies. I, I Maybe I missed them somehow in the handouts or whatever, but I would definitely want to see that because to me it's very, I'm very uncomfortable passing a law to outlaw a product that apparently has a major demand still, and obviously there's all sorts of areas where you guys are saying, we're going to use them here, we're not going to use them here, um, you know, allowing marijuana to continue, the industry to continue to use them under the kind of frankly feeble excuse that there's not some different style ones that might fit their lamps that they use. I mean, there's just some real, real holes in this. You know, normally as products become obsolete, they go off the market. You don't outlaw them. And I just, uh, I have a hard time believing, considering I've grown up with it and been 50 billion of those light bulbs that have been used in the last who knows how many years, that it's that significant of a health risk that we got to actually, as a state, pass a law, especially one with so many odd exemptions in it for certain categories of bulbs that that frankly you can't replace with the type you're looking for. It's going to create, create tremendous consumer confusion on this thing. Anyway, thank you, Madam Chair. Additional questions? Okay, we'll go ahead and open it up for testimony. 
Thank you. Anyone here in Carson City to testify in support of AB 144? Go ahead and come forward. Good evening, Chair, members of the committee. Jessica Ferrado here on behalf of Ceres. Ceres is a nonprofit sustainability organization working with the country's most influential companies and investors to build a more sustainable global economy. Efficiency standards work by removing the least efficient options from the marketplace. We know that lighting accounts for a significant portion of business and global energy consumption. By increasing access to energy efficient lighting technologies like LEDs, we can drastically, redu drastically reduce energy demand, decrease electricity costs for consumers, and mitigate the strain on our electric electrical grids. For consumers, this means more money that can be saved or spent on local goods and services. For businesses, energy savings allow for reinvestment in their facilities and workforce. AB 144 is a good investment, driving 24 million annual savings on utility bills alone. AB 144 is also good for our climate. LED light bulbs cut climate pollution, reducing climate changing emissions and other environmental impacts associated with the production, distribution and use of fluorescent light bulbs. For these reasons, we have joined many of the organizations here today in support in, on AB 144 and, respect, and respectfully urge your advancement. Thank you. Hello again, my name is Angie Dykema and I'm here on behalf of SWEEP, the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project. SWEEP is here in strong support of this bill because it's a simple way to save consumers and businesses money, save energy, get rid of harmful toxic pollutants, and avoid greenhouse gas emissions. The bill accelerates the market transition from fluorescent light bulbs to cleaner, safer, more efficient, and longer lasting LEDs, which have advanced tremendously in the last 10 years and are now widely available and cost effective to replace fluorescents across the different sizes and shapes. Because the LEDs are two times more energy efficient than fluorescents, they generate big electricity savings for consumers. And I'll note there is a fact sheet with the numbers and the savings that has been uploaded to Nellis, but um, some of the some of the numbers, numbers I'll just call out here. By 2030, Nevada consumers and businesses would save more than 19 million annually from transitioning to LEDs, in addition to preventing 80 pounds of mercury waste and 942,000 metric tons of CO2 from entering our atmosphere. There's also the benefit to worker safety by passing this law and removing the risk of handling the light bulbs containing mercury. We urge the committee to support this common sense bill and thank you for your time. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Warren Hardy, representing the Nevada Conservation League. Uh, my talking points or my, my testimony here is very similar to what was just provided, so I'll forego that. Uh, but down on the third talking point is, is the safety issue. Uh, and, and I will just, if Madam Chair, uh, speak to the Senator's comments because I think that's the tricky thing about when the government should step in and start mandating these types of things. I will tell you that I grew up, my first job was working for my dad. We used to call, we used to call ourselves tire busters. I fixed tires, repaired tires, he was in the automotive business. Eventually worked my way into being a front end and brake mechanic. And I remember as a young man <clears throat> using pneumatic air to blow out the dust from brakes before we did the brake job. We subsequently learned that there was a massive amount of asbestos in that, that, in that dust. And so now at age 59, when I go for my annual checkup and get my chest x-ray, it's a bit of a frightening experience knowing how um, exposed I was, overexposed I was to asbestos brake dust as a young man. And when that became, when the government understood the, the, the challenge of that and the health challenges associated with that, they moved to outlaw asbestos brake pads. And so I would just submit respectfully that when the government understands the health risks that are involved in some of these things, it is appropriate uh, for them and us to move to outlaw them. Because I was 12 years old when I started that, 17 years old when I stopped, I had no idea. I was blowing dust everywhere and it was asbestos dust. I almost feel like I'm on borrowed time. So I would respectfully submit as somebody who I consider a fairly conservative Republican that it is time. There are times when the government needs to intervene on safety type issues. Uh, our primary issue, my first talking points were about the savings and the, the low hanging fruit this is in terms of, in terms of being able to minimize 
and, and, and expedite energy independence. But that safety issue is a real issue, and I appreciate the time, Madam Chair. Okay, anyone in Las Vegas to testify in support? Not seeing any. Uh, BPS, can we please check the phones? If you would like to testify in support of AB 144, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair Harris and members of the committee, my name is Barry Levinson, B-A-R-I-L-E-V-I-N-S-O-N a volunteer member of the Sierra Club Legislative Committee. On behalf of the club and our more than 30,000 members and supporters statewide, I'm speaking in support of Bill AB 144. AB 144 bans the sale of compact fluorescent lights, or CFLs. This type of light bulb was an upgrade over the energy inefficient incandescence option in the past. But since then, better technologies have become available and CFLs have been proven to have significant drawbacks that out, outweigh any potential benefits. Firstly, CFLs contain materials, including mercury, which has been already stated in prior testimony, which affects uh, human health and the environment if not disposed of properly. Unfortunately, many people do not dispose of CFLs properly, leading to harmful emissions and pollution. Secondly, CFLs have been shown to be less efficient than originally claimed. While they do use less energy than traditional incandescent bulbs, their lifespans are often shorter than originally advertised and significantly less so than other technologies. This means that CFLs need to be replaced more frequently, leading to more waste and increased environmental impact. Thirdly, there are now better alternatives available on the market that are not only more energy efficient, but also safer and longer lasting, and thus more economical. LED bulbs, for example, use even less energy than CFLs, do not contain toxic materials, and have a much longer lifespan. For these reasons, we believe that banning the sale of CFLs is a step in the right direction towards a more sustainable future. It will encourage consumers to choose safer and more efficient alternatives while also reducing the amount of toxic waste in our environment. Uh, for these reasons, we urge support of AB 144. Thank you very much. Hello again, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jamarion Williams and I am the Government Affairs Manager for Western Resource Advocates. Um, I am here to uh, voice my uh, support of Assembly Bill 144. Uh, WRA supports this bill because it will save Nevadans money. LED bulbs are the safer and cleaner option and are two times more efficient than fluorescents. A transition away from fluorescents to LEDs would result in Nevadans saving more money since LEDs cost less to operate and last twice as long. By 2030, Nevada households and businesses should expect to save more than $26 million annually on their utility bills. Fluorescent bulbs contain mercury, which is a neurotoxin that threatens the health of Nevada residents and the environment. When fluorescent bulbs are broken, they pose an immediate danger to anyone nearby. Uh, furthermore, when fluorescent bulbs are not properly disposed, the mercury can leak from landfills to contaminate rivers, lakes, and oceans, and the fish and shellfish within them. WRA is in full support of Assembly Bill 144 because it will save Nevadans money and help to reduce the harmful impacts of fluorescent bulbs uh, that fluorescent bulbs present to our state. Thank you. Chair, there are no additional callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you so much. Is there anyone here in Carson City who would like to testify in opposition to AB 144? Okay, uh, not seeing anyone in Las Vegas. BPS, can we check the phones for opposition testimony, please? If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 144, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify at this time. 
Okay, anyone in the neutral position here in Carson? Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, Dylan Keith, D-Y-L-A-N-K-E-I-T-H with the Vegas Chamber. Uh, we'd like to thank the sponsor for taking the amendment and we are now in the neutral position. Thank you so much. All right, uh, anyone in neutral in Las Vegas? Not seeing any BPS, can we check the phone for neutral testimony, please? If you would like to testify in neutral for AB 144, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Madam Chair and members of the committee, this is Chloe Chisholm, Government Relations Advisor for NB Energy. I tried to provide testimony in support, not sure what happened, but we are here today in support of AB 144 for the record. Um, this bill aligns well with our lighting energy efficiency goals, and we supported this bill on the assembly side and appreciate the opportunity to express our support to the Senate as well. So thank you very much. There are no additional callers choosing to testify at this time. Okay, any closing comments? Sure. Assembly Member LaRue Hatch for the record. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for commit committee for giving me the time to present this today. I think that the testimony and support really clarified what this bill is about. It is about saving our consumers money. It is about reducing our emissions, and it is about protecting our constituents. And I hope that you can see all of those things and that we will have your support on this bill. Thank you. All right, thank you. With that, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on AB 144 and open up the hearing on AB 57. Your time has come. Thank you for being patient. <laughs> thank you, Chair uh, and committee members. Sean Sever from Nevada DMV. And I do have a very long PowerPoint presentation for you today, Chair. I I'm just kidding. Uh, thank you for letting us present AB 57 to you today. This is a much needed bill to help prevent lien claimant fraud, change when a DMV annual report is due, and eliminate honorary consular license plates. The first part of the bill covers lien sale fraud. Fraud occurs when lien claimants who obtain vehicles through parking violations, uh, mechanic liens, tows, and police impounds profit through a lien sale to themselves for significantly less than the vehicle is valued. Once they obtain the title, they sell these vehicles to the public at market value, achieving a very high profit, and thereby depriving the legal owner and lien holder of both the vehicle and any equity value over the lien amounts, pursuant to NRS 108.310, subsection 4. Throughout, through the regulations process, the DMV Compliance Enforcement Division has worked with industry on proposed language that would clarify and reflect legislative intent and DMV policy and we're happy to continue working with these folks. Uh, second, NRS uh, 487.557 requires the DMV to submit an annual report to the legislature concerning garages, garage operators, and body shops yearly by January 1st. Because the due date is the day after the last day of the reporting period, and it's also an annual holiday, the DMV must submit the report late in violation of the law. The DMV would like to change the reporting date to February 1st to ensure that all data in the reporting period is included. Third, the DMV is proposing to eliminate the language in Chapter 482 that allows the issuance of honorary consular plates, which will bring Nevada in com into compliance with recent changes to federal guidelines. Federal rulemaking came out recently that requires states to stop issuing these plates. The federal government will now issue them. So we appreciate you considering our request, and I have our Compliance Enforcement Administrator J.D. Decker in Las Vegas to help answer questions. Thank you for your time today. 
All right, thank you. Committee members, do we have any questions for Mr. Sever? Senator Spearman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. So, can you do me a favor? You just said something that could be complicated after three hours of testimony. Um, walk me through what happens when you said tow truck or parking violation. So the car is towed. Walk me through how that ends up with the person getting a lot of money from it, just step by step. Sean Sever from the DMV. JD, do you want to cover that? Sure. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair. Through you to Senator Spearman. Uh, JD Decker, for the record, uh, Chief of the Compliance Enforcement Division for the Department of Motor Vehicles. So there are various conditions that um, uh, must be met, but when a non-consent tow results in the legal owner and or lien holder uh, finance company not responding to notice to come and pick up the towed vehicle and pay the tow and storage fees uh, the law the law provides that the garage tow operator repair shop can acquire um, well can can reimburse themselves through processing a lien sale to basically wring the value out of the vehicle in order to pay the tow and storage so if i have a twenty thousand dollar vehicle and I'm owed $10,000 in tow and storage fees, it, um, and I don't mind not following the law, I can make money by lien selling the vehicle to myself for $10,000 and then selling it to the general public at market value, let's say $20,000. So now I've profited um, above and beyond the uh, tow and storage fees that I was owed originally by selling the car to myself. So our bill is submitted to ensure that um, the vehicle is submitted uh, or is sold at auction um, to the general public at fair market value and that the tow operator is paid what's due, but any excess proceeds go back to the legal owner and the lien holder uh, and not um, all proceeds going to the tow operator. Additional questions? questions? Okay, we'll go ahead and open it up for testimony then. If you were here in Carson City to testify in support of AB 57, go ahead and take your seats. Good evening, Chair Harris, members of the committee. For the record, I'm Paul Enos. I'm the CEO of the Nevada Trucking Association representing our tow car members. Um, we are here to support Assembly Bill 57, and this really has been an issue that we've kind of run the gamut on, and I want to say thank you to Mr. Decker and the folks of the DMV for working with us on this issue over the last few years. Um, there's three ways tow operators make money. They make money on the actual towing of the vehicle, they make money on the storage of the vehicle, and if somebody doesn't show up to pay those two fees, they can, but not always, make money on selling that vehicle through the lien process. How this bill addresses that is it requires you to have a public auction. So you have an arm's length transaction, so we don't have the kind of scenario that Mr. Decker described, and we appreciate that. Now, I'm gonna tell you, this is not a widespread problem through our conversations with the DMV. It's probably four out of every 100 but we feel it's a big enough problem. It's something that we should address. You know, we're talking about, a, you know, we hear stories about Corvettes or Ferraris that get towed. Typically, that's not the case. Somebody's got to come and pick that rig up. Sometimes it happens, um, but if it doesn't, um, you know, being able to get rid of these vehicles, dispose of these vehicles through this process is something we appreciate. We've also been talking about some other issues with some salvage titles, and we are trying to work through some of these issues with the industry and DMV. So we are still working on some things that hopefully we can come to some comedy on, but whether we do or not, we support this bill as is and would like to see this move forward. We just think there may be some other tweaks that hopefully we can fix because I'd rather see if we can get a fix in 40 days. So it's not like 25 months, like this last issue that we were trying to deal with this. So. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, and once again, thank you to the DMV for uh, working with us on this. 
set your endorsement for the legislature to meet more often? Sounded like it. I, I needed some clarification. Mr. McKay. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Andy McKay, Executive Director of the Franchise Auto Dealers Association. I, I know you guys want to get the heck out of here, so I'll, I'll keep this brief. Uh, we support the bill. I'd be remiss if I didn't thank uh, DMV for this. We tried to work on it in the interim uh, in, the uh, in the regulation process. Uh, frankly, ran out of time. And uh, this, I think, as Mr. Yunus alluded to, this is not a frequent event, four out of 100, but that's serious enough that um, DMV grabbed the bull by the horns and they're gonna fix this, so we fully support the bill. Thank you for your time. All right, um, anyone in Las Vegas? Not seeing any. Uh, BPS, can we check the phone lines for testimony in support of AB 57? Thank you, Chair. There are no callers at this time. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Decker, I do see you. You are a person. Just meant anyone to testify in support. Opposition thank testimony. You, Chair. I, I don't. <laughs> Opposition testimony here in Carson on AB 57. All right, uh, no one to testify in opposition in Las Vegas either. BPS, do we have anyone on the phone? Thank you, Chair. There are currently no callers at this time. Okay, neutral testimony. No one in Las Vegas. BPS, are the phone lines still empty? Yes, Chair, there are still no callers at this time. Okay, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing then on AB 57 and roll right into public comment. Anyone here in Carson City for public comment? All right, no one in Las Vegas either. BPS, check the phones for public comment, please. Chair, the lines are open and working, but there are no callers at this time. Okay, with that, we are adjourned. Have a great evening.